I'm Jimmy Fallon. I'm Madison Allworth. I'm Bill Hemmer, and this is the Fox News Rundown. Wednesday, September 21st, 2022. I'm Lisa Brady. More books are being banned in schools across America. Communities are very different, and communities need to have these discussions on what's appropriate for the children uh, in their community. But libraries are worried about the big picture. Certainly, there will always be books on the shelf that you might not agree with as a parent, as an individual, but they're there for someone else. I'm Dave Anthony. There are new Fox Power rankings out showing Republicans have a good chance to take back control of Congress in the midterm elections. When we make campaigns and elections about individuals or personalities, we lose. When we make campaigns about ideas, we win. And I'm Tommy Lahren. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. For libraries across America, this is Banned Books Week, an effort to call attention to censorship with challenges to books on the rise, especially in schools, sometimes led by parents. It is not your responsibility to worry about moral values. That is the parental right. You are treading on parental rights all over the place, and you are also violating the Constitution. School board meetings like that one in Mentor, Ohio, continue to be heated forums over what's being taught and kept on the shelf. But a report from the nonprofit Penn America, which describes itself as a free expression group, says there's been a rapid acceleration of censorship with more than 2,500 book bans during the last school year in 32 states and nearly 140 school districts. The group's CEO calls it a movement that's turning schools into political battlegrounds and often targeting books about LGBTQ issues or racism. What we saw was the erosion of parental rights. Tina Deskovich is a former member of the Brevard County School Board in Florida and co-founder of Moms for Liberty. So our chapters are, are pretty autonomous on what they want to tackle in their own communities. They hold monthly chapter meetings and they review their local school district, um, the school board agendas, and we tell them. And so as our chapters are starting to do this, uh, they're finding concerning things, they're finding concerning curriculum, concerning assignments, and they're finding concerning library books in their libraries. And so uh, it's not coordinated from the top down. We don't have um, master lists of concerning curriculum anywhere or concerning books anywhere. Each chapter locally is finding their own problems. What kind of books are you most concerned about or is it or as you say it's really kind of on a case-by-case basis with local districts it's it's on a case-by-case basis but there is reoccurring themes um you know a lot is happening now i don't want to switch topics on you but um with comprehensive sex ed it really does tie into what we're seeing in a lot of the curriculum and it's the same uh, scenarios that are happening in some of these that are being found in some of these library books for example um gender queer has been very concerning it's been found on middle school shelves all across the country that's um, children as young as 11 and 12 years old and um the book gender queer depicts sexual acts um actual graphic drawings of of sexual acts between um, between two individuals and uh, if, if if someone lays eyes on that I have shared that with so many people when they when they say why are you concerned about books in schools what, what's the problem all I do is just open I'm like turn to any page you know and and most parents that I have given that to have been very concerned what about the argument that there are you know marginalized groups of children for instance children with you know, gender identity issues who maybe feel as though they need access to this material or adults around them feel like they should have access to certain materials, at least in the school library, if not in the classroom, so that um, it can be, you know, a source of comfort or information for them or that they would be more marginalized if they didn't have access to this. Is there a distinction between what's in the classroom and what maybe could still be available in a school library, bearing in mind, you know, that different ages could be involved, you know, and any distinction between someone who's in high school versus someone who's in elementary school? Yeah, so let's, uh, the point of Moms for Liberty is to make sure parents are involved in these selections, that parents get together as a community um, and review and discuss these types of books and where where do they want them placed in the school. And I will tell you that um, ex- 
like sexually explicit material, pornography, and anything of that nature has no place in school. There is no child that needs to identify with pornography or sexually explicit material. Uh, we, you know, I haven't seen any of our chapters that want to get rid of books that help children um, find characters that they identify with. They are concerned about um, pornography and sexually explicit material in the classrooms and in the library. In Brevard County, Florida, where I served when I was on a school board, we had a parent bring forward um, a book that he was very concerned about that was found in a middle school uh, and high school library that shared a library. The book was designated for AP students, so college kind of college level students, and yet children had access to it as young as seventh grade. And so as a school district, we decided the book was gonna go in a section of the library that was for AP students only or with parental permission. I mean, a lot of these solutions are not complicated and don't need to be such heated debates. Do you think that it would help if some of those types of solutions were standardized in some way, you know, adopted across the country so that there was more of a process involved? Because I know another criticism of the criticism has been that, you know, some books are ending up on banned lists before anyone has actually read them. I'm a pretty strong proponent of local control, and especially in situations like this. Even the Supreme Court has come forward and said that uh, the definition of obscenity and what's appropriate really has to be decided locally. Communities are very different, and communities need to have these discussions on what's appropriate for the children uh, in their community. Is there common ground to be found here? Um, You know, something like making books available but requiring adult permission or adult notification? Yeah, there's absolutely common ground. You know, I just spoke to what we did here in Brevard. I think every community has to decide there can be opt in options, there can be opt out options. Um, There is, I think if if people want to find a solution, and if school districts will listen to parents that have concerns, I think there are solutions to these problems for sure. A word of caution from Deskovich that there's a lot of misinformation. She says her group is not trying to ban of mice and men, for instance. And she offers reassurance about First Amendment concerns. She says Moms for Liberty is only concerned about material that shouldn't be in front of children and not in a public education environment. But the American Library Association says under its preliminary data, total book challenges this year may exceed last year's record numbers, with more than 1,600 titles targeted so far. I have done this work for two decades now, and I have never witnessed the volume of challenges that are being reported by library workers and educators to our office on a daily basis. Deborah Caldwell-Stone is the director of the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom. Uh, We might hear from two or three professionals saying that they've gotten a request to reconsider a book a week a few years ago, but now we're getting four, five, sometimes 10 reports a day reporting on demands to censor books and often on topics that reflect the lives and experiences of groups that are traditionally marginalized in our community, gay, queer, transgender people, persons of color, and uh, it feels very targeted. I don't want to discount individual parents. We still see challenges where an individual parent raises a concern about a book that their young person is reading, uh, and that's entirely appropriate. And in fact, we create methods for parents who have concerns about books to take those concerns to the library professional, to the educator, and to have their concerns addressed in a fashion that respects everyone's right to read and allows everyone to be heard. So it sounds like it really goes beyond any debate about whether, you know, parents might have a legitimate concern about certain topics like sexuality, maybe feeling they should have more control over that type of narrative in their children's lives kind of goes beyond that into, you know, a broader range of things brought into these bans. Absolutely. We have no problem at all. A parent should have the ability to guide their child's reading. They should have the ability to discuss with library workers, with educators, what their values and choices are, and ask that their young person be provided materials in line with those values and choices. But what we say is that, you know, there's all kinds of families, there's all kinds of parents 
there are all kinds of individuals in the community and that as a public community institution, both public school libraries and public libraries should serve the needs of everyone in the community, which means that certainly there will always be books on the shelf that you might not agree with as a parent, as an individual, but they're there for someone else. They serve the information needs of someone else and they deserve a place on the shelf. You know, no one ever asks anyone to accept everything you read, but we believe in the ability to read it and make up one's own mind about it. We think that's foundational to our democratic society, foundational expression of our rights under the First Amendment, uh, something that library workers and educators across the country fiercely defend, that freedom to read that we should hold so close uh, and protect so fiercely because we're one of the few societies that offer that to their residents across the board. Do you think there should be different standards between what books might be banned in school libraries versus public libraries? Uh, I believe that we do have to recognize that school libraries don't have the same resources as public libraries, nor as broad a mission. But I do believe that school libraries should be able to serve uh, the information needs of the students they're serving. And particularly in high school libraries, there's often a need to address topics not addressed in the classroom or offer resources on topics not addressed in the classroom. And we often hear that particularly books dealing with gender identity, sexual orientation, can be life-saving for students who are grappling with those issues, who are feeling bullied or excluded, who are having educational difficulties. Finding books that reflect their lives and experiences on the shelf can improve literacy, improve educational outcomes, and really lead to a far better result for them in the long run. And the students themselves are telling us that. So banning broad categories of books based on a particular parent or group's moral or political objections to that topic is not serving the needs of everyone in the community. And the public school library in particular should be able to do that. Deborah, do you think that there can be common ground here? You know, the books can be made available, but maybe require adult permission or, or notification when there's an issue with certain books in schools? I believe that uh, there should be mechanisms in place for a parent to communicate with a librarian or an educator about their choices and to have that respected. I can't think of a single school district these days that doesn't have a policy in place that allows a parent to ask for substitute materials in the classroom or ask that their student not be lent books that they disapprove of. And again, as I said, we support that. The problem is, is that um, applying broad restrictions um, can really be uh, an issue, especially for older readers. We should be thoughtful about what mechanisms we use to restrict their access. Um, we know from no less of authority than Justice Scalia uh, that young people have First Amendment rights and that they should be able to exercise them and exercise choices around them. Uh, but of course, as always, you know, parents should be able to talk to the librarian or the educator and, and have their wishes respected. Deborah Caldwell Stone with the American Library Association. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Lisa. It's been great to talk. This is Tommy Laren with your Fox News commentary coming up. It's exactly what Republicans want to hear. They have a good shot in the midterm elections to win back control of Congress. New Fox News power rankings project a GOP House majority of 231 to 204. If the two parties split, the 30 House race is considered competitive in November. Though, if Democrats won them all, they'd keep a slim majority. The rankings also project Republicans would take a 51-49 Senate majority if they split the four closest races evenly with Democrats. Ronna McDaniel, 
Chairwoman of the Republican National Committee tells Fox they must focus on two issues, starting with inflation. The price of eggs, the price of milk, insurance, rent, everything. Everything right now is costing more for every American family. And then crime. But Democratic Congressman Akeem Jeffries counters. Gas prices have continued to go down now for 14 consecutive weeks. And further help is on the way as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. That is the new law that GOP critics claim would actually add to inflation. I think the the likelihood Republicans take back the House is extremely high. Will Hurd is a former congressman, a Republican from Texas. Republicans and, and candidates and Republican elected officials need to stay focused on the issues at hand. I'm talking about the difficulty of American citizens for putting food on their table, a roof over their head, and taking care of the people they love. We need to be focused on those issues because when we do that, we can win. You know, with, with the state of the economy right now, we should be talking about how Republicans are going to be taking a 50. Uh, uh, seats and have the largest majority in a really long time. There should be no question about being able to take back the Senate. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, The economy is going to get worse in in Q1 and Q2 of 2023. So the the, the people that are actually getting impacted by high inflation um, are not, you know, wealthy folks on Wall Street. It's the folks on Main Street that, uh, um, that are being impacted by this. And it's being further caused by bad policies by the, the Biden administration. So this is an issue that is always going to be at the top of people's minds. But we have to be articulating what would we be doing differently in order to make sure that the economy gets out of this. On the other side, Democrats have seized on the Supreme Court ruling on abortion, which undid the federal legal right to the procedure, letting states ban abortion or further regulate and restrict abortion. Democrats say Republicans are stripping rights away from people and they're going to go after other rights. And in a lot of polls, they've had some success on this issue. Uh, A majority, a supermajority of of, of Americans uh, believe that, you know, when it comes to the case of rape, incest and the the life of a mother, that the procedure should be allowed to to happen. Um, This is and being consistent. And look, I'm I'm pro-life. I I believe life begins at conception. And but we have to articulate how this isn't going to impact other things. You know, I've been very clear on things about um, when it comes to when it comes to marriage. If two people love each other, they should be able to enter into an, in, into into a marriage. Um, the government shouldn't be telling you who can live together or, or be married. Uh, my dad's black and my mom's white. They got married in 1971. And that was four years after it became uh, illegal for them or there was a court case that said it was OK for them. Some of these things need to be codified um, into law. That's a way to to address these issues. So Republicans, they're on the defensive on this issue. So what should their case be when they're out there talking in debates, when they're out there talking to voters who are angry about the court ruling? What should their answers be? Look, uh, for me, I do believe that states should be responsible for making this decision. And so I think this comes down to what state you're in and what those policies should be. Um, I think when it comes to especially when it comes to the life of the mother, making it very clear that a, a doctor should be able to take care and, and protect the a mother as as they see fit, as that doctor sees fit so that they're not being questioned when they're in that room. I think that is that is something that a super majority of Americans agree in. And I think we always forget sometimes um, that the, the old saying that all politics are local and, and, and that really is true in, in house seats. And so I, I think um, especially where the, the Democratic Party is now um, when it comes to a crime and, and being seen as soft on crime, um, being terrible when it comes to, to border security, uh, these are things that are going to, to issues that could propel uh, Republican candidates in seven weeks. Will Hurd just mentioned border security. Amid a record surge of migrants coming here illegally, 
Texas Governor Greg Abbott has bused thousands to Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, also a Republican, sent about 50 on charter flights to Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts, angering Democrats. Congressman Akeem Jeffries says it's... Radical, reckless, regressive, and reprehensible. The sheriff in Bear County, Texas, Javier Salazar, has opened an investigation into what DeSantis did. Somebody came from out of state, preyed upon these people, um, lured them with promises of, of a better life, which is what they were absolutely looking for. The governor's response? No migrants were forced to go, and they signed waivers. It was clearly voluntary, and all the other nonsense you're hearing um, is just not true. DeSantis also tells Fox the migrants were not welcomed by those on Martha's Vineyard who called him inhumane. And not only did they not welcome him, they deported him the next day with the National Guard. Will Hurd knows all about this issue. When I was in Congress, I represented the largest part of the border in the country, 825 miles. I represented 29 counties. It took 10 and a half hours to drive across my district. And we saw these problems the last three years um, of border security getting, getting uh, increasing, the number of people crossing the, the border illegally increasing. And the fact that we just crossed 2 million people um, being apprehended um, a, a, along our southern border in one year, that's an astronomical figure. And, and so what we're starting to see is um, the number of people that are being released into the country um, under President Biden, um, Chicago, uh, Washington, D.C., New York, they're seeing. And, and, and this is only a fraction of the people that a towns like Del Rio, Eagle Pass, Laredo, El Paso uh, have to have to deal with. What we're going to see in November in South and West Texas is if it's not record turnout, near record turnout of Latinos for Republican candidates. And part of that is being driven by border security. And when it comes to the people that live on the border, border security is actually a public safety issue. So you have a situation where both sides are trying to make an issue ahead of the elections now as democrats are saying look we're the party that's helping these migrants we're doing everything we can we're being humane they're the ones that are just shipping them off yeah look, look here's what's frustrating about a lot of this under the previous administration um democratic members of congress were on the border almost weekly crying and outraged about uh, what was happening at these defense detention facilities they're worse under a, a, a Democratic president and a Democratic administration. Where is the outrage at the human smugglers and human traffickers that are taking thousands of dollars from these men and women that are trying to flee pretty crummy and pretty terrible situations to come to America? Where is the outrage that those human smugglers are lying to these people about what the rules are when they come to to America, and and so where is the where are these 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 mayors and governors of states run by and cities run by Democrats saying, hey, Texas, Arizona, guess what? Here is what we're going to do. Please bus more people, ship more people. We're going to help y'all out take off and, and, and carry some of the burden that y'all have been carrying for the last three or four years. Right? This is where the conversation should be, rather than both Republicans and Democrats using this issue as a political bludgeon uh, against each other. Another big factor in November, former President Trump. You're going to elect an incredible slate of true American first Republicans up and down the ballot. But Democrats are painting those Trump-backed candidates as extreme. President Biden calls them MAGA Republicans, a threat to democracy. They embrace anger. They thrive on chaos. They live not in the light of truth, but in the shadow of lies. Trump says it's President Biden who's being divisive and a threat. When we make campaigns and elections about individuals or personalities, we lose. When we make campaigns about ideas, we win. And so if you want to talk about the successes of the previous administration, talk about those things that were done that were helping to improve the country. That's where our focus should be. And when we make these about competition of ideas, our ideas are better and we can win. And that would be my suggestion to most of the candidates that are running over the next seven weeks.
How do Republicans, you are considered a moderate Republican, you have been critical when you were in Congress even of then President Trump. How does the party handle this? Here's how I operate when I was in Congress. I agree when I agree, I disagree when I disagree and be ideologically consistent. And so just because if, if I disagree with President Obama doing something, then I'm going to d- disagree with President Trump if he was doing something similar. Right? And I think the way um, uh, Republicans in, need to handle this is to show the voter that you're going to be ideologically consistent and, and that your boss. And I always say this all the time. My boss was not the Speaker of the House or the major, the minority leader when we were in the minority. My boss was not the president of the United States. My boss was those 700,000 people that I represented when I was in Congress. Reflect that and don't ideologically or, 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 or blindly follow someone. And, and let's be frank, uh, President Trump lost the House, lost the Senate, lost the White House. And right now, when you look at, I even think his polling numbers are the lowest they've ever been. And, and, and Joe Biden's are still low, but they're increasing. And, and guess what? You, you don't want that trend line to continue to go um, to increase over the, next, over the next seven weeks. Former Congressman Will Hurd, of course, a cybersecurity expert, former CIA clandestine officer. Thank you very much for joining us. Always a pleasure, my friend. And in other news, I'm Gianna Jalosi. A Las Vegas cosmetic surgeon says tech workers are flocking to his office to get a leg up on life. That surgeon is one of only a handful of surgeons in North America that specializes in leg lengthening procedures that can extend a person's height three to six inches. The magic happens at Dr. David Parshad's Limplast X Institute. Dr. D told GQ magazine that he breaks the patient's femurs inserts metal nails into them that can be adjusted and then extends them a tiny bit every day for three months with a magnetic remote control. Ouch. It can take months to slowly elongate the bones and for the legs to heal. One patient told GQ he couldn't walk for months as the nails stretched the nerve and the tissue around the bones and those meaty muscles like the hamstrings, resulting in relentless pain. That same patient noting, though, taller people, quote, just seem to have it easier. The procedure comes with a price tag of 70 grand to 150 grand, depending on how much taller you're looking to grow. The doctor told JQ many of his clients are high earners from the tech sector, mostly men, but some women. The American Society of Plastic Surgeons noting in 2019, male cosmetic procedures were up 29 percent from two decades prior. And the Limplast X docs say business has been booming, nearly doubling since the onset of the pandemic. For the Fox News Rundown, I'm Gianna Jalosi. Did you hear the news? Now you can. With instant updates from Fox News for Amazon Alexa. Just say, Alexa, play news from Fox. In Fox News. It's the latest when you need it on demand from Fox News and Amazon Alexa. Rate and review the Fox News Rundown on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Tom What's on your mind? Americans are struggling with Bidenflation, and that includes brave men and women of the U.S. Army. But don't worry, the Army has released guidance for that. Food stamps. Sergeant Major Grinston encourages service members and their families struggling to put food on the table and make ends meet to go on government food assistance. These brave men and women risk their lives and sacrifice for our safety and freedom. And the best advice the U.S. Army has for them is to get on food stamps? Our military members are always essential workers, and they shouldn't be in such a pinch to go on food stamps to begin with. And the fact the Army would so nonchalantly suggest that is so wildly inappropriate it boggles my mind. We spend on climate change, electric vehicle subsidies, student loan forgiveness, and pay increases for politicians, but our soldiers are left pinching pennies? Boy, it sure seems like our national priorities are out of whack. I'm Tommy Lahren. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. Rundown. Stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. Put the power of over 100 meteorologists and the worldwide resources of Fox in your hands with the Fox Weather Podcast. Precise, personal, powerful. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Love Fox News? Click the subscribe button to get more of the news and opinion you trust. And click the Fox News Rundown playlist for the latest episodes.